Thanks for the invitation. Uh, today I learned two major things. The first thing was, was a lesson about the Israeli mentality, you might say, when I sat there, I just was seated shortly before, before we started uh, the, the sessions here. The director of the Israeli Space Agency came into the room. I was sitting already and he was shaking hands with everybody, also with me. I stood up, so as it is expected from a German person, of course. Uh, and he meant, just sit down. I said, sorry, just bad habits. And he said, uh, I'm German. And he said, but you're in Israel now. So, okay, <laughs> that's the one thing. And the other thing was the lesson by the director, former director, Charles Bolden of NASA, who was talking about the dock and the size and the fight and so on. Uh, well, that's partially true, of course, but I think there are, uh, for, for the educators, there are other different and important things to know how to, to face a challenge. Um, when I was asked by Dr. Shimrit Maman to give a talk at this conference, she just sent me a voicemail and said, Toby, I would like you, no. <laughs> That's not true. She said, Toby, I want you <laughs> to give a talk at the Runa Ramon conference. I had absolutely no idea what it is about here. So I just said, clear whatever you want me to do. Um, well, sometimes it's better not to know how big the challenge really is to give a talk. So I'm working at the German Aerospace Center. You can see there's another name on my first slide. That's Andrea Lisa Nagel, my colleague, not only my colleague, and she's part of this presentation because she, uh, she led one of the programs which I'm talking about. And she's basically, she's a teacher. So I thought um, all the speakers before me told you why doing space education. So the reasons why, why it's important. And I think um, it has come through to everybody of you, we all understand why it's important. Uh, so what I want to tell you is basically how how we do it in Germany, at least. So it's just a very, very German version, I know, of doing space education, but perhaps it's a bit inspiring for you. So the German Aerospace Center runs about 50 research institutes. Why do I say about? Because we are growing all the time, so that means perhaps in the last two days another one has come to these 50 um, at 27 sites, 27 locations all over Germany. We have almost 9,000 9, employees and 1.8 thousand in Oberpfaffenhofen. So perhaps you want to learn the word Oberpfaffenhofen. It's a funny word, I know. In <laughs> Thank you. We also have uh, offices in Brussels, in Tokyo, in Paris, and so on. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, take a picture, please, of this. And so I know Oberpfaffenhofen in Hebrew. And we have an annual budget of about 1 billion euro for the research at DLR and another 1.5 billion for the uh, DLR Space Agency. Um, so it's lots of money, but we are doing lots of research. And I wanted to tell you something what we are doing in Oberpfaffenhofen so you get an impression where I come from. The DLR does not only research in the fields of aeronautics and space technologies, but also in energy, transport, security and digitalization. And now that's our site. It's a nice place close to Munich in southern Germany. And you see here below in this picture, you see um, the, the, the runways of our airport Oberpfaffenhofen, and that's the DLR Oberpfaffenhofen site with all the buildings. We have uh, just a short guided tour of our site. We have the Space Operations and Astronaut Training Facility where we also have the German Space Operation Center. That's one out of four places on Earth where the International Space Station is controlled. So there are the other ones in Tokyo, in Houston, in Moscow, and then again Oberpfaffenhofen. I think that's a bit funny. Um, and from, from this point, we are controlling the Columbus module on the ISS. We also have a division called Mobile Rocket Base, which is able to launch um, sounding rockets from Norway or from Sweden. Normally, we don't launch these rockets from Germany because there's too much population in Germany to do these experiments. Sometimes they also launch their rockets from Australia. We have 
one out of two Galileo control centers. The other one is in Fucino in Italy. Uh, Galileo is the European satellite navigation system, which is being mainly developed also at the DLR. At least the coding for the signals came from DLR. And the satellites, in fact, these nice uh, satellites of the Galileo constellation, they are built by OHB. So I saw the OHB, that's a satellite manufacturer out of Germany, uh, on one of the slides before. We have uh, Earth Observation Center, which is, uh, is an, it, it hosts two institutes. The one is mainly for remote sensing technologies, so for the sensors of satellites, developing them and um, well, how, to, how to use them. And the other one is the German Satellite Data Center, which deals with uh, all kinds of, of applications of satellite data. Then we have our flight division, and the flight division, flight experiments division, is of course is uh, very lucky to have this airport close close by. We have uh, at the DLR we have two uh, two sites where we have research aircrafts. One is in Oberpfaffenhofen, one is more in the middle of Germany in Braunschweig. There are more the, the research on the airplane, so uh, you might say research on how do airplanes fly more. Uh, without any emissions or without so much em emissions and stuff like this. And we are doing research with the aircraft. So we are using them as a, as a research platform to fly into the high troposphere or in the high, uh, lower stratosphere with our biggest airplane, this HALO, um, and doing measurements in the atmosphere like, like particle measurements. We also have a smaller aircraft. I will tell you something about this later on. And we also use our aircraft for validating systems which should fly into space. So, for example, um, to build a system, satellite system like the Terrasa Tandem X mission, it is necessary to, to develop the technologies, not only the radar systems, so the antennas and stuff like this, but also the, the data analysis. And that has been done before you launch the satellites using aircraft, and that's why we are very lucky to have all these institutions, these institutes together at one side, we have a robotic and mechatronic center in Oberpfaffenhofen, but I will show you um, an example of what they are doing afterwards. Then there's the Communications and Navigation Institute, which is developing new coding for, for satellite uh, communications or the transmission of data uh, via big distances in a very high speed. But also uh, these, these swarm, swarm intelligences, intelligences for drones uh, are developed at the Communi Communications and Navigation Institute. And we have one institute dealing with atmospheric physics, uh, for example, dealing with questions about climate change and global warming, but also um, with very, apparently very, very basic and simple things like how fast is the wind. So if you think about measuring the speed of wind, of the air and the wind, that's not so easy because what you see from space are clouds, of course. So you can measure uh, in, in different layers where you have the clouds, you can measure the speed of the clouds, but you have no possibility to measure the speed of the wind itself. And there's a new satellite system called IOLUS, uh, which was developed at the uh, Atmospheric Physics Institute together with, pa with uh, other partners, of course, which is able to measure the wind speed up to 1.5 meter per second from space. That's very, very important because we can only measure wind in the atmosphere at the moment using uh, stratospheric balloons, weather balloons, and we can launch weather balloons from the Pacific or from the Atlantic Ocean, so uh, there's a big lack of data, and that's what the IOLUS mission will fill in. And then finally we have our DLR school lab, one out of 13 DLR school labs, um, where we're doing space education. Why? So short words about why we are doing space education. Uh, you see here some of the results of the PISA study. I don't know whether the Israeli people go so crazy with the PISA study, do they? I don't know how the teachers think about this, but you might think, might think about it different than the Germans. So we see here in the first column, we see something like scores about uh, how, how good the, the students uh, reach the, reach the questions of the, of the studies. So you see that German kids are a bit 
above the average that would be about here of the OECD nations. So that's luckily we could say that German kids are really good at sciences, at natural sciences. But if you think about this point here, the science beliefs, so that means how they think about how science works. So are uh, this really truths or is this just a hypothesis or whatever? Um, then we are under the, the, the scores of the, of the average of uh, OECD nations. And it's the same with our career expectations for the German kids. Only 15.3% of all the German kids would like to have a job in the field of natural sciences. That's too few, of course. So we have here a big problem. And if you compare the girls even less than the boys. And then here comes the reason the motivation of the German kids is too low. So they are not really inspired by what they are learning in school about physics and chemistry and biology. And that's the real problem in Germany because we also, like Israel uh, as well, we, we live from high tech and that means we need lots of uh, scientists. In Israel, you know, there are different problems. Um, so I think we could learn from each other. Our kids could learn from the Israeli kids how to be inspired and how to, to have more motivation for physics, chemistry and biology. And the, Germ uh, the Israeli kids could learn how to better cheat in the test. So <laughs> perhaps that's the whole point out of PISA. What we are doing at the DLR is we have a program called the DLR Campus, which is made for students from elementary school up to postgraduate students. Um, and the, the kids from school come to our school labs, to our DLR school labs. We have at the moment 13 of them at our DLR sites. And in a classroom visit, for example, or they can, can have internships at our school labs um, and different other programs like the DLR Talent School, which is more for the, the already very talented or the outstanding uh, students. And we have this academic lab, which is more for the higher education, so university students as well. Um, typically, we have the program for the, for the higher education in summer schools like the Flying Classroom. So uh, in the Flying Classroom, the students are provided the opportunity to put their own experiments onto our research aircraft or to build their own rockets and doing things like this. Um, well, the basic concept of our DLR school labs is for all these 13 sites, it's absolutely the same. We want to, to take the fascination of our research and make them capable for the students. So you see on these two images or this image and this video, you can see how we do this. This is our humanoid Robert, Robert Justin. It's a very complex system, complicated as well, and uh, it's very inspiring, of course, because it's very fancy and sophisticated, but it's too complicated for students to learn with it. So we have downscaled everything onto another little robot, which is called Azuro. Azuro stands for another small and unique robot from Oberpfaffenhofen. And this little robot is able to do almost nothing. So it's, you might also say it's another small and useless robot from Oberpfaffenhofen, but it's not. From the point of view of an educator, it's not, because you can learn everything what is necessary to learn about a robotic system on high school level using Azuro. Um, and let me show you with a short video clip what's the fascination behind this. Um, I won't speak on my own, but give the word to Alexander Gerst. Subwiz Justin is a fantastic experiment because it takes human robotic interaction up to a new level. We have a, a test here of a robotic system that is controlled by uh, an astronaut in, in a spacecraft, in a, in a space station in this case, and the robot is actually located on the surface of a planet. Well, uh, in this case, it's a test planet, it's Earth, right? Later on, this could be Mars, it could be the Moon. All right, I'm coming a bit closer to the SPU one. The scenario is, is as we are the crew on orbit 
around Mars and we send a rover down there as the first scout to see how the conditions are like, uh, whether it's safe, what the uh, atmospheric parameters are. And uh, so we command that rover, but uh, the difference to how rovers were commanded in the past is that this rover actually knows to navigate uh, by himself. So I don't have to tell him every uh, millimeter to move in which direction or what to do exactly, but I just give him high level commands like check out this, uh, this uh, solar panel or uh, pick up this rock. And he will actually do that. So of course we can't take our students into space like Alexander Gerst and we can't make them use Justin, but we can make them build their own robotic system and that's Azuro. So basically that's the whole concept. We try to take the students uh, where they are, pick them up where they are and connect them with the science which we are having at our sites. So you can see here up here two girls building their own Azuro robot. They sold it together um, completely so it's absolutely their own Azuro and they program it on their own and um, have a fancy uh, Mars-like environment in Oberpfaffenhofen to test and to improve their Azuro robot and basically that's the, the, the backbone of our concept. Not only to educating the students in uh, how inspiring and how, how well how fascinating space technologies are but also teaching them really uh, how to use it and how to do it on their own, especially. Um, the reason why I'm here, so I, I had another slides for about, I think, 15 minutes, um, but I won't, won't bother you with this. Um, the reason why I'm here today, and I'm not alone here, but my colleague Lisa is also here as well, is that we are doing this not only in Germany, but we are also doing this kind of experiments and this kind of um, projects already for five years now with Israeli kids in connection with Dr. Shemut Mann from the Ben-Gurion University uh, of the Negev. And these are not only inspiring programs for our kids, I think for yours as well. And I love these programs, um, not only because we can, we can transfer data and we can have an exchange and the students learn something more about collaboration and international uh, and uh, collaboration and uh, things about technology and stuff like this, they can also learn something about the different cultures. And what is more, uh, everybody knows that the past, the history of Germany and Israel is nothing very beautiful to talk about. It's a really uh, sad, terrific history. Um, for the kids, which are in our projects, it's not the past, it's not the history, it's the future. And that's the, for me, the, the very, really for me personally, the inspiring thing about our projects, that we bring kids together, um, we're having the, the, same, uh, the same background and the same problems and the same challenges, but they can solve it together. And that's why I'm very happy to be here. I'm very honored to be here, and thank you for providing me this opportunity. Applause